Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for coming here. Um, I know this is weird to speak about something called MongoDB on this conference, but it's not only MongoDB. So let's see if we can talk about something else. Um, you'll probably know by the title, and this is the reason you have come here. So before starting with StoreDB itself, let's, let's do a quick demo, right? Let's, let's see what Mongo looks like and what we can learn from it. So um, let's try to, yeah, basically, I'm going to stop this for a while. If I can manage to do it. Yeah, OK. I guess you can read the font size there, right? OK, so we can, with MongoDB, we can basically fire a, a Mongo shell. I don't know if you're familiar with this. And you know, you can, uh, for example, try to insert a document, like, like this, for example. Or you can try to insert a different document. I'm not going to type it. That's why I have it in the history. Like this other one. And then you can try to you know, find which documents you have on your collection. This is basically how MongoDB works, right? Now, the interesting point here is that after we have inserted these documents into MongoDB, uh, we can basically go back to the shell and try to uh, find how this MongoDB is running. And it's not running. So there's no MongoDB here. There's got to be something else. And sure, of course, it is, it is uh, something which is called not, not MongoDB. Let's, let's give it a hint and let's run this other MongoDB command, which is build info, which returns at the, you know, which version we're running MongoDB. And well, maybe you can read it better right now. It is, again, it is not MongoDB, so it's TotalDB. And this is the topic about this, this talk. It is something that works as a MongoDB server, and it is absolutely compatible, as you have seen. We were using MongoDB 3.0 command line client zero modifications, but it behaves in a different way. And surprisingly, or non-surprisingly, it uses PostgreSQL. Okay, so let's start this again. Oh, okay, it's just started. So, mm -hmm. interesting. Let's really start the game. Supposedly, this should be running. Oh, okay. Seems to be here. Or not. My demo worked better than the presentation. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Oh, okay. Now I can go ahead. All right. So this was the demo, very quick demo. Now let's, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. So I work for a company called Ekte Data. You can try to guess what is, why is this name? Um, that's an exercise. Uh, we do basically a lot of research and development in the database space, but we are strongly focused on Postgres, which we have been using for quite a long time. We also do some consulting and training. And uh, we're also the founders of PostgreSQL uh, user group in Spain, which is, it has become in a little bit more than a year, the third largest Postgres user group in, in the world, just after New York and San Francisco. So are way, behind, way, you know, uh, in front of us. But anyway, and uh, you know, there you have my Twitter account and my LinkedIn if you want to connect with me. There's also a Twitter account for DotaDB, which is NoSQL, on SQL. So let's get start, started with TotalDB. You have seen already it working, so this is no, no fat. It is something real. What is it? In one slide, it is a NoSQL database, JSON-oriented, document-oriented database. It's open source. It runs on Postgres. It is AGPL licensed, and it has MongoDB protocol compatibility. So it's not a fork of MongoDB. We're just sitting on top of it and implementing the MongoDB wire protocol. Now, some, some saying it uses PostgreSQL as a storage backend. 
So we're storing things in, in PostgreSQL. And we know all the advantages that come with doing this, right? Um, why do we do this? Well, from a technical perspective, what we saw is that most NoSQL databases, if not all of them, which have been you know, popping up a lot lately in the last years, they have all started from scratch. And doing a database from scratch is something really difficult. I wouldn't do it myself. So uh, concurrency, journaling, durability, transactions, those are really hard things to, to do and then to get them right. PostgreSQL, general relational databases, but specifically PostgreSQL, have been doing this for a while, a real while, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, and and it's, it's a shame, basically, to throw this all to the trash, you know, and start from scratch. Maybe funny, but that's it. It's not very practical, in our opinion. So we prefer, let's start with Postgres and build on top of it. It's reliable, it's flexible, it's proven. That is really important, it is proven. And, you know, we started with Postgres. Now, next question is usually, okay, you're using JSONB. And, well, JSONB is absolutely cool. It is very flexible, it works very well, it is really high performance, it is something incredible. However, for our purposes, JSONB is not enough. We need something else. First of all, there's no updates, and we need to update documents without reading them all and rewriting them back to the server. This is gonna come soon, I guess, but you know, anyway, we need it, it now. Plus, uh, there's a lot involved with, uh, with the MongoDB API related to the query that is quite complex and we needed something more flexible than what JSONB offers. Plus, we are doing some new things that MongoDB is probably not doing and they cannot basically be done with JSONB, which is basically schema repetition. We are saving a lot of disk space by avoiding all the schema repetition. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later. So, if we're not using JSONB, how are we storing things inside DoraDB? Well, we're using a relational database. So it would be very simple to just have a two column right, table with the ID and uh, you know, JSONB or byte A or whatever. Uh, that's exactly what some other people have done before trying to emulate what we're, we're doing in DoraDB. But that's not what we wanted to do. So we wanted to leverage the idea that we have a relational database. So let's go relation. And that's what we do. So, how really do we store things in DoraDB? We store things in tables. There's no JSONB, there's no binary stuff, no blobs. It's all tables, pure tables. Um, what we do is when we're re receiving a JSON document, we split this do JSON document into what we call subdocuments. Each subdocument, it is a, a one level depth structure. So no nested things. When there is an object which is nested within a, a given subdocument, we basically store a placeholder or a pointer to it. And then every subdocument, which is already only one level depth, we store it on a separate table. We analyze the effective type of that subdocument. So imagine you have a subdocument with name, surname, and age. That will probably require a table with a text, text, integer. So we locate a table which is text, text, integer, and we store the data there. If that table doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. We will create a table automatically. After all, creating tables in Postgres is very, uh, this is very fast. We've done this in the past where uh, we did a project where we were creating uh, 15,000 tables per second. So it's not a big deal. Yeah? So you're creating one table just based on the type, not necessarily the name of the field. Hmm. Yeah, that is a good point. It's both. So, uh, Tables, uh, the name of the columns match exactly the name of the attributes of that subdocuments and also the type. So if you change the name, we will create a new table too. All right. This is better seen with an example. And uh, so there is a final piece on how to glue this all together, which is what we call the structure, the document structure. The document structure is basically the document without the data. The keys, the value, sorry, yeah, the keys and the containers, in other words, the arrays, and the nested objects, that is the structure. So it's very short documents, even though for very large JSON complex documents. And this is how we, uh, what it helps us to glue all together. Um, so answering your question, the keys are mapped exactly to attributes in the tables. And if we need so, tables are created dynamically. Let's look at examples, it's gonna be easier. So imagine, for example, this document. Here we have three levels, right? I don't know if you can say laser, no. Right, there's one level which contains basically here name, data, and nested. That is the first level. There's another level which contains A and B. 
And then there's another one, which also contains, uh, contains J and Deeper, and Deeper has another level, which contains A and B again. So what we do first with this document is to split into sub-documents, as I was saying, each one containing just one level of uh, depth, which would look, look like something like this. Name with data and nested, which are placeholders to the real objects. A and B, A and B at the bottom, and then J42 and Deeper with another placeholder for this Deeper. Placeholders do not require storage for us. So we will be basically storing in one table which contains name, which will be a string. So we'll need one table with an attribute called name with a string. Another table with A, which will be uh, an integer or numeric or whatever, and B a text. Another one with an integer column called J. That's it, because the fourth one will fit on the same table as the second one. And this is very important. We're factoring out all the metadata. So um, if we look internally how this is effectively stored in TorDB, it looks like, exactly as I was saying, plus you know that MongoDB contains an internal uh, attribute, which is called underscore ID, uh, which is a 12 byte uh, random string or so random, random string. So the first table contains the name, which belongs here to the first subdocument, and the underscore ID, plus two internal columns, which we require in TorDB, which are the DID, which is the document ID, and the index. I'll explain later what they mean. The next table, table demo T underscore one, basically contains the uh, structure for storing here the second and the fourth subdocuments because they contain a column A, which is a number or integer, and B, which is a string, right? And then the uh, third subdocument here, this is J42, is stored on the last table, which is, uh, only contains a field called J. Now, there's another table, which is a structures, which is, as I was saying, basically the, the document type, the effective document type, and it's very easy to read. It's basically, this is the do JSON document. This looks like the original JSON document, and then the main level, it is on table number three. Then there is a nested object called data, which contains its data is sitting on table number one. And then there's another one, which is called nested, which uh, contains uh, its main data is on table number two and contains a nested object called deeper, where uh, its, uh, its uh, information is contained on table number one, indexed by index number one, two. So this is basically used, this index field is used to distinguish which entry on the same document, which are on the same table, belongs in which place, the placeholder. So basically with these three tables plus the structure, we're able to glue the document together and recover all the information that we had before. Then we're also, now that we're in the relational space, we can also share or repeat the structure. Imagine that someone inserts an old document which share exactly the same structure, the same attribute types, the same names. So uh, why don't reuse this structure? And that's what we do in a normal relation table. So we have final table, which is called root, which basically identifies documents by their document ID, in this case zero, with the structure that you're using. So the structure can be reused for several documents. Now, why do we go through all this seems like painful exercise of splitting and putting placeholders and storing tables and creating dynamic tables and so on. Well, first of all, because we were inspired by a previous talk uh, by uh, Christophe Petus, which basically show that storing things in a relational way is, could be even orders of magnitude cheaper than storing them in a you know, JSON way. Because there's a lot of metadata repetition. I'm gonna show that to you later. So by doing it in this way, we are factoring the structure, we are factoring all the key repetition, and we are storing things in a very efficient way, which can be used later on to do some cool things. Like imagine you want to query in a pure SQL way, table T1, the one in the middle here, or you want to update a field there. So you could say update demo T1 set A equals to A plus one. And this is a very cheap operation in SQL. Whereas it would be a very expensive, or compar comparatively at least, a very expensive operation in, in MongoDB or even in JSONB. And we did some benchmarks. And basically what uh, we were able to find is that to store the same information as compared to uh, MongoDB, we required only 68% uh, down to 29% 
of the same disk space to store the same data, which is pretty good. Plus, if you think, you know, storage is cheap, that is true, but I.O. is not cheap. So if you have to read more, then you need to pay more I.O., and that is not cheap. So this is very interesting. Uh, more storage than plain text or than us? No, uh, photographs. I mean, uh, if I read it correctly, uh, Toro DB by using Postgres SQL requires less space. Yes. Uh, but my intuition tells me that uh, MongoDB would probably require less space. Oh, well, the reality it is it is not. <laughs> because, well, first of all, what we're doing here, we're not repeating all the time all the keys because we're factoring them in, in the definition of the table. Whereas MongoDB, every document is repeating the same and the same and the same keys, right? So if you insert a million documents with name, surname, and age, that string's name, surname, and age are repeated all the time. That wastes a lot of disk space, which we are saving. Plus, the internal representation that MongoDB uses is, is very verbose in terms of disk space. It's called BSON, which is a serialization of, of JSON, and is very inefficient. We're going to show some examples of how those collections look like. It will probably help you understand why this is happening. But this is, yeah, this is basically the idea. And it can get worse or better than, than this. All right, a little bit about the software, how this is built. So ThorDB is written in Java. Sorry about that. But it works for us. Um, it has been designed. Uh, in a purpose to work with Java 6 so it can be deployed in corporate environments. We are still stuck in Java 6 or those who are previously in Java 6, I'm sorry. Um, it's been tested in basically in the Oracle VM and the OpenJDK of course, uh, but there's also another high performance JVM which is called the ISL JVM which uh, is uh, great and is pulseless JVM which will probably bring some benefits on top of it. And it's currently deployed as a standalone application, a jar file. So basically download ThorDB, ThorDB, get the jar file, run java.jar, and you're ready to go. No complex installation process. But it can also, it's going to be also uh, published as an ER file, which basically means that you can drop that file into your favorite application server, and it will run. Which is very good, because a lot of companies have standardized on the process of deploying something on application servers. So it will be completely a standard process for deploying this on a corporate environment. Um, we're not alone. I mean, as I was saying before, we are not able to build big things without relying at least on some other things that are really big. So we're relying on millions of lines of code written by very smart people that we are building upon. Like, well, Postgres, of course. But also Netty, which is a network I.O. framework which provides us event-driven, asynchronous, high-performance networking. It's very easy to implement the protocol on top of Netty. Uh, the Hickory connection puller, which is probably the best Java connection puller uh, we have ever seen. Uh, the standard tools in, in Java that makes your life easier, like Waba, Juice, Findbacks. Uh, Juke this is a great, great tool for querying database, like Postgres from, from Java. So we're building on this well-proven, well-tested software. So software is probably better. Thanks for this. Our code base is very modular. We are excessively modular in our design. We try to use every modular, every layer that we can. And we have built some layers which are very interesting on their own. Like for example, what we call the D2R. D2R is the layer that transforms in a, a representation independent manner from documents to relational. So now we're speaking MongoDB protocol. In the future, we may speak a different protocol and convert from that protocol to relational. We also have an uh, internal representation of what is the document, which is called Kiva document, which is, again, a representation independent layer of a document. And we also have an abstraction layer over the database. So we can plug in different backends. We're going to show some ex experiments later. Um, well, this is probably only interesting for Java developers, but this is what looks like the module structure. I'll skip this. But there's another important layer which we're building upon, which is called MongoWP. This is Mongo Wire Protocol. And this is a layer to basically uh, help developers that want to create server-side type or middleware type applications which speak the MongoDB protocol, like TorDB. That's why TorDB is built on top of this library. 
It is a very simple to use library. It, is, it is, offers a simple callback interface where everything is parsed for you. So if you, you, know, you do an insert, uh, this layer will decode the insert in an event-driven, asynchronous nature, provide you a callback with all the message decoded and an object to basically issue a reply. You don't need to understand the protocol, not even a single bit. So it's very convenient. And it's also very modular. It's based on Netty and you know, can be used for developing in the future all the tools like proxies, query routers, uh, transparent loggers, whatever, for the MongoDB protocol. It can also be extended for other protocols, but this is what it is right now. It's very modular, we'll skip this. So, now what we have built is something which uh, relies on Postgres to implement Mongo features, right? And we implement the Mongo protocol and I'll show you how it saves disk space. But that wasn't enough, we wanted to go further. We're relying on Postgres and Postgres, you know, perfectly well what it offers. So why don't offering, basing, basing our, pro, uh, our code on things that Postgres does, try to offer things that Mongo can do simple. So we went a little bit beyond, or that's what we're trying to do. For example, we have addressed five possible pain points for MongoDB users. We're gonna go one by one. The first one is what we call the schema-less fallacy. So no SQL databases are schema-less, right? Well, no, there's no schema-less thing. It's more dynamic schema or something like that, but the schema, it is effectively attached to the data. So look at this example. It is a fallacy. Well, first of all, because I'm not that tall, right? Uh, but other than that, if you look at this document and really analyze it, the things that are highlighted in blue, they are a schema. The attribute names, the start of, of a container, not an array, a container, that bracket, that's also schema, that marks a structure. So isn't that what we really call metadata? And isn't metadata a schema? So there's a schema here, right? If we look at the internal representation of MongoDB, the Bison serialization I was referring to before, it's even worse because this is how it looks like once it's been stored into MongoDB. So there's a schema on the attribute name, but then there's also a schema specifying the type. It is typed representation. And there's also a schema like, for example, the containers, the supposedly arrays, internally they are represented like nested objects where the keys are zero, one, two, three, whatever. So there's a lot of schema here. And as you can guess, if you insert a lot of documents with the same look like, right, you're repeating a lot of this schema all the time. That's why we're saving a lot of disk space. So these things are not schema-less. And that's why we call it a attached schema, where the schema is attached to the data. It, you know, we've seen what benefits we have from uh, factoring this out into tables. Now, going beyond this, if you think how basically uh, an engine like, more, uh, like uh, MongoDB stores documents, they are serialized to this representation and put one after the other one. So if you insert different document types in, in one after the other, they will be stored again, one after the other. So they will be kind of mixed. So if you really insert documents and look, analyze how they look like internally, they may look something like this, right? You know, there might be persons mixed with cars, mixed with payments, mixed with, I don't know, you know, all the types are one going after the other. But as I was saying, there's a lot of repetition. In a normal exercise, if you insert millions of documents of typical real use case collections, you find something like this, that effective types are repeated. Types here with the same color are being repeated. So uh, we did some tests and we find out that in the, even in the worst case, you won't find more than thousands of documents, different doc document types on a given collection, even with millions of documents. There's called some degraded cases, but they're not usual. And we know that creating tables in Postgres is not a big deal. First of all, I mentioned before, it was fast. I, I, we also know, because we also did an experiment some years ago, that we can create a large number of tables in Postgres. We tried creating two billion tables in Pro Postgres and it worked quite well. So it's not a big deal. Plus, we've seen thousands in the worst case for real cases scenarios, right? So 
this is how things are stored in a JSON or yeah, JSON data store like MongoDB, and more or less this is how we are storing them. So apart from saving Dusk and saving I.O. consequently, what we're doing is that we are classifying effectively the data. It's like if we were partitioning data by type. So we can do something, which is what we call query by structure or query by type. Is that we have, remember that structured table that we had that was the way for us to merging the document back together? Well, we can use that for doing this query by partition. Because just only by looking at that table, if you remember, it is something, it was um, here, this uh, structure table at the top. Just by looking at this table, which has a low cardinality, thousands in the worst case, as I was saying before, we can find out whether your document, your query, will match one or more structures. Like imagine you're looking for a, column, uh, a query which contains deeper. Well, we can look here and, and figure out which documents exactly have that column without looking at the real data. So we only need to look here to guess which tables to query. So rather than scanning the whole database, which is the only way, apart from indexed columns, that you can do in a NoSQL data store, we only need to query a subset of the data. Is that JSONB? Um, yeah. <laughs> Current implementation is using JSONB for this document. Uh, but it's, you know, we're using barely, I mean, these documents are small. Cardinality is not very big. And uh, we're using basic operations on top of them, JSON operations. We were thinking about uh, even uh, adding compatibility for 9.2 by using JSON rather than JSONB, and that's something we can do. Right, so we're querying by type. We're scanning only a sub sub subset of the data needed to address the query. And that gives, a, gives us the possibility of you know, looking only a subset of the database to address a query. There is an, even a, a potential use case for this, very interesting, which is what we call the negative queries. If you're querying for something that doesn't exist, well, on MongoDB, for example, or any other NoSQL data store, you will have to scan the whole database. So if it's a petabyte database, you'll have to scan petabyte of data. You have to find out that there's, the answer is an empty set. Whereas here, we'll look at the, at the queries, at the structure table, which is usually very small, and we'll say, no, the answer is the empty set. That table is so small that we're caching it memory. So we will answer from memory. So it can be, technically speaking, infinitely faster for negative queries. I don't do benchmarks to that because I could put the number I want. Um, what else? Well, single node durability. Uh, this is very simple. Postgres durability is cheap. It has been done, has been tested for so many years. MongoDB, it is not that simple. Uh, the only way to achieve true single node durability in MongoDB is using a parameter to the insertions or to the updates called JTrue, which basically uh, weights a database, performs a journaling, and then adds sync to the desk. But this operation is not as optimized as it is in Postgres. So it's very expensive in other way. I bet there are no benchmarks out there where they're claiming the speed of MongoDB that are using JTrue. They're not using JTrue. Otherwise, the speed drops sig very significantly. So it is not very cheap. Whereas for us, it is very cheap, or it's what it is. But definitely, it is something way more optimized than you can find on, on MongoDB. Plus, we can enforce this. In MongoDB, you cannot enforce this. It is a responsibility of the user of the application whether to send JTrue or not. So, there's no way to enforce strict durability on single node. Clean reads. So this is a very interesting topic. If you go into the, to the internet and, and you Google or search, right, for uh, whether MongoDB has or not suffers from dirty reads, you will end up concluding that the answer is no. As you can see here, there is no dirty reads in MongoDB. Oh, really? So let's look at MongoDB documentation. Basically, if you read that the official documentation updated for version 3.0, it says MongoDB will allow clients to read the results of a write operation before the write operation returns. Damn, that sounds like dirty reads, doesn't it? Um, if the MongoDB terminates before the URL commits, 
queries may have read data that will not exist after MongoDB restarts. Hmm. That doesn't seem like very clean, right? And um, well, the thing is that they claim they are not dirty reads because if you look at the definition, it, dirty reads involve uncommitted data. And they don't have transactions. They don't have commits. So you cannot claim that they are dirty reads because it's not uncommitted data. They are always committing data, right? But that's definitely not clean reads. So we decided to call these tainted reads. Now, if you dive, if you, if you dive deeper, there is a parameter called a snapshot. Oh, a snapshot. So if I use your query under snapshot mode, that's going to be clean, right? Nope. The snapshot does not warranty that the data returned by the query will reflect a single moment in time. OK, enough. So it's not. Basically, what a snapshot does is that it prevents you from having a document returned twice while in the process of your query. Thank God. Now, in Postgres, this is very easy. We have transaction isolation modes. And for us, it's enough to issue queries on repeatable read mode. Read committed is not enough because Mongo protocol allows uh, a query to be uh, run under different uh, round trips to the server, which can have no state. So we need to uh, open, when MongoDB opens a cursor, we open an equivalent cursor in TorDB, in Postgres, right? Which lasts uh, for a while, right? And we open that cursor in repeatable read mode, in read-only mode. And thus, we get consistent reads. So again, this is something which is provided for us by the grace of Postgres and give us really true clean reads, even the protocol being stateless. Atomic operations, OK, this one is very easy, right? Uh, we have transactions in Postgres. So all, we can make all the operations, you know, all or none at once. Uh, MongoDB uh, has a hard, harder time here. They have even a flag which is called uh, isolated, which basically means they take a big lock and do only one write during that operation. But even then, that is not atomic. It prevents insertions or updates to be interleaved with all the operations happening concurrently because they don't happen concurrently. There's a big lock, exclusive lock there. However, a single insert or one of them may fail. So when people are programming with MongoDB, they should, they don't do, but they should be checking every document whether it was finally inserted or updated or not. Well, in TorDB, that's not a problem because we can run in a transaction. Indeed, everything is run under a transaction. So it's just basically we can offer atomic semantics uh, uh, in, in TorDB. Indeed, we don't offer them by default. I mean, it's offered by default. You can change it by using a parameter which is called continue an error. And in that case, uh, we will do a transaction per document, which will be slower. So basically, if you want to emulate Mongo behavior by default, we will be slower. But we can do it. It's all about flexibility. What else? High concurrency. Postgres is highly concurrent. Works extremely well. And MVCC is absolutely great for concurrency. Uh, MongoDB, it's not that concurrent, uh, at least not until version 3.0. Under previous versions, or what the current storage uh, backend was called MMAP, they basically take an exclusive lock and uh, the new White Tigers document locked. But again, uh, it's hard to match uh, concurrent behavior of MVCC and Postgres. So we get better concurrency again for free. What else? Which state is uh, .db currently? It is still in developer preview. We are trying to follow a release early, release often policy. So we're encouraging you to give it a try, download and submit bugs, issues, uh, send us feedback. It is still, there's a way to go. I'm sure maybe things will still break, uh, but please give us feedback, uh, send bugs, go to GitHub, all the source code is publicly available. And we really appreciate uh, any, any comment or help that may come from you. How to use it? As I mentioned before, it's very simple. Yes. Either build the source code yourself with Maven or download the jar file and do java.jar 
It's hard to be jar file and specify the database username and port in which you want to run the software. That's it. There are a couple of command lines more available, but this is basically the way to use it. It's very simple. What's been the response? Well, so far the community response has been overwhelming. It's been great. There's a lot of interest, especially in the NoSQL communities, uh, to, to about DoorDB. Uh, we made, fortunately, front page to Hacker News, given day, and uh, get a lot of you know, stars on GitHub. Uh, we're trending repo number two on that day. It's only behind a project uh, by Facebook which was about SQL, damn. <laughs> uh, if you read the tweets, this is very funny. This is not necessarily my opinion, but you know, there's people saying, uh, basically loving the look of TorDB, it speaks the Mongo protocol and Postgres relational backend, best of both. Speaks natively the MongoDB protocol and saves your data. Um, why not TorDB? It's like Mongo, but it's not built on a platform of fail. There are some other comments, which is like, you know, as nice as SQL storage engines are these days, projects like TorDB speak to a real problem. SQL is a fucking terrible API. Oh. Okay? <laughs> um, you know, it's been very interesting. There's uh, great feedback, and we're very happy with it. So, what is the roadmap? Where are we at? As I was saying before, this is currently developer preview mode. Uh, we expect version 1.0 to come around, to go out around Q4 this year. We're trying to get it out quick soon. Uh, it will be production ready. Uh, it will implement a large subset of the MongoDB protocol, basically all that is usually used, not crazy things. And uh, it will also include the MongoDB replication protocol. So you could replicate from, from MongoDB into TorDB, plus maybe some other stuff. What are our priorities in terms of development? Well, priority number one for us is to be able to offer MongoDB API on top of what is current infrastructure for most companies. Uh, most places there's relational database rather than a NoSQL database, rather than MongoDB database. So we want to address that. So we want them to make it easy to offer, for whatever reason, uh, MongoDB APIs to their developers. And then offer on top of that many features that I've been talking about today that are not currently offered or offered in a different way by uh, options like, like MongoDB. And finally, performance. Performance is very important for us, but it's not number one priority, at least now. However, performance is, I would say it's really good. Um, there's a lot of benchmarking to do, and you are, again, this is open source, you're welcome to contribute, please benchmark it and submit the results. We'll be happy to see them. Uh, in, but I can tell you, it is, it is really good so far, but we want to make it better. And finally, and as a final address for this talk, I want to show you a couple of things that we're doing in a highly experimental fashion to go on even beyond that we, what we have, I've been presenting today. First of all, we tried to use columnar storage using the CStore plugin from our extension by Citus Data. And we also want to try to use, as long as we have an abstraction to the, uh, for the backend, we want to use Postgres Excel as a likely backend for DB. So this will require a little bit of, of extra code, we basically uh, having a distributed cache, because we are caching some information. This will need to be distributed, but it can be done somehow easily. And finally, try with PGSharg for uh, doing sharding uh, in TorDB. I'm going to talk a little bit about the first one. So remember those pictures where we were showing how do we store JSON documents, right? Um, by splitting them into tables, which are of a uniform type, we have basically classified data into columns. Now, if you would like to perform big data types, big data loads on top of a, what would have been otherwise a NoSQL database, it's really hard because if you think about doing an aggregation, aggregated operation on top of a, something which you don't know what is the structure, you don't know which documents have those columns. You have to go document by document, parsing them, analyzing all them, and then performing the, you know, the aggregated operation. Whereas in our case, as long as we have pre-classified the data, you only look at the subset of the data. But now, if you want to do it like vertically, in an aggregated fashion, why not use a columnar store? 
Now that we have split things into tables, we can now go columnar. And we gave it a try to this. We haven't analyzed performance, but we have analyzed that uh, what is the requirements for storage for doing these things. And CStore from Citus Data allows us to transparently compress the information, which works very well if the information in that columns is of a similar type. So what are the results that we achieved with this? Basically, comparing to MongoDB, we required from 20% down to 1%, 1.17% of disk space to store the same information. This is, of course, a very synthetic benchmark. It wasn't done by us. It was a benchmark by EnterpriseDB, which uh, was comparing Postgres and Mongo. So we took that same uh, benchmark, that same data. So I'm saying it's a little bit synthetic. Don't, speak, uh, don't expect this in production. But this is an example of what can be done. We were storing in just 50 megabytes a collection of documents which took four and a half gigabytes of disk space in MongoDB. Imagine the potential for this. Everything is going to be in RAM compared to disk. So this is basically it. Um, I'm welcoming questions now. Okay, the MongoDB protocol, uh, basically uh, when you're doing a query, there's, it's a, it is a stateless somehow. So you do a query and it will return by default at most 1,000 results. Then if you want more, you need to do a separate request, which is completely independent. So there's no notion of a session. So you issue another query and say, get more results. And, and then you, uh, you, you will basically get more results from that cursor. Now, in order for us to do that, we will keep a transaction open, but we can reuse the connection for all the things if we want to, and that's what we're doing. So uh, basically, we place the connection, and we leave the cursor open in repeatable read mode, so we can do any operation in between if we want it, but the snapshot is stable. Okay. We do that because you're using serial logical instead. Yeah, but uh, as far as I understand, we don't need serializable because the operation doesn't need to be in serial order. It is enough that the snapshot is consistent at the start of the transaction. And it's well, read-only. The reason you use serializable is that serializable in Postgres is actually lower overhead than repeatable. Oh, really? Yeah. Even, if, even in read-only mode? Well, maybe not. Maybe not in read-only mode. But we're good to test yeah. anyway. But we're in read-only mode because, you know, so there's no, no test. I mean, there's, there's no possibility of failure. Yeah. Next, next milestone, uh, which will be probably version 0.3 or 0.4, I like 0.4 because it's binary, uh, we'll, we'll address this issue and we will implement the functionality of uh, replicating the, basically the client part of the protocol, so you'll be able to replicate from MongoDB to TorDB. That'll pro I guess that will help in that direction. Yeah, I mean, the, the features that may have, they have uh, announced in 3.0 are basically that the, now the storage, and the storage is pluggable, so you can plug new storage engines, and they have, they're offering two. The previous one, uh, which has uh, a course, uh, sorry, a finer right now locks, locking, and the new one, which is called WireTiger. WireTiger seems to be way better than what it was before, uh, and it's more concurrent too. But I don't know if it's, let's say, production ready, right? Uh, WireTiger also offers uh, optional compression. And with the compression, they save a lot of disk space. But of course, that compression is not free. It requires CPU cycles. Yep. OK, this is a very common thing. You do an update, and one key disappears, and another one pops up, right? In that case, we'll migrate that part of the document to a different table. So we never do alter table. Tables are, table structures are immutable. Either you have a table that fits your data and you will put it there or you will create a new one. 
Sorry, where is the clip? No, we have seen that we can have two billion tables in a Postgres database. So no, no, no need to. I know could be done in. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And with with that number of tables, uh, slash dt takes forever, literally. But I don't intend this to be used by a from PG admin. Although you. May do it. All right, is that it? Okay, thank you very much for, for coming. <laughs>